All right. Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire Breathing Rob. Please like and subscribe to our videos on YouTube. This is how we get more viewers, more subscribers, and we're working really hard on that because we do have many people that have amazing stories to tell, especially in this time of need for all Americans. So we thank everyone for that. I have a person on here, Amin Az Azam. Did I get it right? You did. Thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, so, firstly, let's you know tell the, if you could tell the viewers a little bit about you and what made you want to become a psychiatrist. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I always like to tell people I'm half Palestinian, half Armenian. Spent half my childhood in the Middle East before moving to the U.S. as a as a middle schooler, um, and uh, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I came here to do my psychiatry training at the University of California, San Francisco, um, and. Uh, I am married, I have two kids. Um, I chose to be a psychiatrist because during medical school, I was going around in different parts of the hospital and I saw patients that had physical health ailments and some of them were having like emotional problems as well. And so I was really fascinated by the interplay between the mind and the body and how your physical health affects your emotional health and vice versa. And so I got really turned on to that area of medicine and healthcare. And then I discovered that psychiatry was a really amazing part of, uh, of medicine and chose to become a psychiatrist. Right. So I did find out about osmosis through, I don't usually watch this program, but I guess this TV network, I should say, with Fox News. And I saw one of the men that work with you really uh, take one of the anchors, we'll say, to school on Fox yeah. News um, because the way they were reporting the COVID-19 crisis. And it's great that he did do that because we need um, good information out for viewers in general, whatever the channel they're watching. But with that said, can you speak what osmosis is? Sure. So you're referring to my colleague, Rishi Desai, also a physician. He's a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Coincidentally, he and I uh, sang together when he was in medical school and I was doing my psychiatry training. We sang in an acapella group at UCSF, so small world. Um, in any case, uh, Rishi uh, is the chief medical officer of Osmosis. Osmosis.org, we are a company that was started by a pair of medical students from Johns Hopkins University during medical school. And they realized that some of the materials their faculty were producing were not as good as stuff they could produce. And so they wanted to help each other learn and help their classmates learn. Long story short, Osmosis has grown from those humble beginnings to be a health education information source. Uh, and uh, we want to promote high quality health information so that all the world's population has access to high quality health information. And that's what Osmosis is now. What advice would you give to people that are in this tough struggle? And this, we don't know how long this is going on. This could go on for another year. Uh, who knows until they get that vaccine going. Uh, but with that, what advice would you give people to make sure that they stay sane through this real tough time of stress. Yeah, um, I'm going to share a lot of resources with you later in our, in, our talk, in our talk together, but I'll just start by talking out loud. So uh, it's extremely important for everybody to tend to their physical well-being with social distancing and wearing masks. It's also extremely important for people to care for their emotional and mental well-being. And so uh, obviously, if, if people are out of work, that's a huge psychological distressor. And, um, and so, you know, financial insecurity is, is uh, another burden. Um, I think the first and key piece of advice I want to offer everybody is um, you knew yourself before the virus and before the, the, the challenges we're facing as a community globally. So you knew what gave you joy beforehand, and you knew what kinds of things you did for pleasure that were um, safe and healthy. As much as you can keep doing those things, even with all of the stress that's going out there, uh, the, the more you can keep doing that, the better. But let's be really concrete as examples. I used to love to go hiking in the woods with my family, and I can't because the parks are closed. I can, however, walk in my neighborhood where I feel safe and I can walk socially distanced. So um, if I can't walk, if I don't feel safe in my neighborhood, I at least have the privilege of looking outside this room and there's a window here and I can see a tree of my neighbors. So I can spend some time looking at that tree. It's a cheap substitute for what I used to be able to do, but I know that it gives me some psychological health and well-being. And so that's an example. If you used to love sports and you can't watch organized sports, I know this sounds crazy, watch reruns. You know the ending, but 
but you're still watching it. So you're going to get some pleasure out of that. Do you used to like to go to movie theaters and you can't go to movie theaters? Can you watch a movie at home? Do you used to like to hang out with friends in a bar and you can't do that? Why not sort of do a Zoom meeting where you're drinking a beer with each other? So think about the things that you used to do that brought you emotional health and well-being and figure out how to adopt them in the current coronavirus era we live in. Are you worried about this virus really getting even more out of hand with people taking the streets, without people social distancing because everybody's crowded into that one um, area protesting, and with that tear gas where people cough and cough and cough and, you know, and who knows if they don't have, if they have the virus or not. So what is your opinion on that? I am absolutely worried. I think it is an extremely uh, challenging situation where people are, as you said, appropriately declaring with their right to uh, with their right to protest peacefully. People are appropriately declaring their disgust with the structural racism of our country, yeah. and um, um, when you get lots of people together in enclosed places, you increase the likelihood that anyone who has the coronavirus will be passing it to others who are in that same physical space. So I absolutely am worried that we're going to see uh, spikes in coronavirus uh, outbreaks in different parts of the United States and in the world where people are protesting. So I think the real challenge here is how do individuals decide how to balance their right to declare their disgust with their desire to keep the public safe and each each individual is making those choices i hope very much that um we will minimize any kind of uh hostile tactics by um by uh police forces and i hope we will also uh, make sure that people protest peacefully and not sort of uh, uh prevent the u.s american right to declare when you're frustrated with your government Mina Zam here on Fire Breathing Rock. Like I said, I interview a lot of fitness people. They talk about exercise and meditation and yoga as activities to reduce stress. I agree with them 100%. But, you know, there are some people that are, have disabilities where they might have chronic arthritis and they can't, you know, do these um, methods. You know, they can do meditation, but as far as exercising and yoga, they can't do that as well as somebody maybe my age or a little bit younger can. What would ex activities would you tell those people that can't, really get into that so they don't get into a rut um, as far as activities. Yep, sure. So I have uh, some patients in, in my, uh, that I work with who have chronic medical conditions. So those are people with active symptoms and no cure. Some of them will have symptoms that make it hard for them to physically act uh, be physically active. Um, mm -hmm. One of my patients, as an example, and she's given me permission to share the story, um, you know, feels unsafe leaving the house because of the global pandemic. And so we talked about, well, could you actually walk laps in your house? Kitchen, bedroom, kitchen, bedroom, kitchen, bedroom. Like it seems on the one hand of it, well, that's not exercise or that's not really getting out, but it is better than nothing, right? So people who have stairs in their house and, and who are able to go up and down stairs, up and down and up and down. That is exercise, even if you're not going to the gym. And so things that keep your body physically active, absolutely you can do those kinds of things within your physical limitations at home. I mean, how about people that we know in California and even all over the country, I should say, but especially in California, we have an autism epidemic. We have people that just in general do have disabilities where they may have cerebral palsy and other disabilities in general. How would you tell people that are parents to speak to those people that uh, maybe it's their kids that have those these type of disabilities that they don't understand uh, and they can't comprehend this virus that they used to, you know, doing a routine, getting up, going out, whether maybe it might be with an aide, maybe it might be with their family, uh, to a job, it could be anything. And now they're not doing it, so they can't comprehend that. So how would you approach doing that? Because that's a big issue in our country with people with disabilities. Sure. Well, let's, uh, let's, I want to separate out physical disabilities from cognitive or sure. uh, the, the thought processing difficulties, because those are different answers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the cognitive disabilities, it depends on what the issue is. So as a concrete example, a lot of times people feel worried about talking to their kids about death and dying or about sort of scary topics like that. And a lot of times kids comprehend a lot more than we give them credit for. We tend to sort of baby them much younger than their uh, technical capacity for understanding is. So you need to do it in an age-appropriate way. But I think if children see adults in their lives who are 
not afraid of topping, talking about these topics, um, they can, it, you're role modeling that kids can talk about it back. And the kids will ask the questions that they don't understand. So the key here is to think about the age of the children um, and do it in age appropriate ways. I will show you later in this call some resources I put together, but it's not, um, it is useful to look to organizations that are specific to the issue. So if you have a child with autism, there are gonna be national or international organizations about autism and they will have information about how to talk to your kid with autism about COVID-19. So we can look at some of those as an example. The key here is to look for high quality information sources from communities that are uh, dealing with similar issues. So when you talk with children about how to talk about death and dying, there's gonna be resources for that from the Association, or the American Association of Pediatrics, as an example. So what would you, you know, tell people that do look up to President Trump and other leaders in our country that think they're too macho, whether they're men or women, to wear a mask or to really follow what the scientists and the doctors are saying about this virus, that it is deathly scary. Over 109,000 people have died already, and that's going to go up even more. And now we're talking about, and, and I'd love for you to get into this later on in the interview, about now with the flu season coming up in the winter time, this could get even worse. You could have a double whammy. But first, could you talk about these people like President Trump that are, don't want to wear a mask? I would say that even uh, leaders we look up to make mistakes um, and uh, sometimes choose to do things that prove to be wrong in the future. Really good leaders admit their mistakes and, and demonstrate and declare those mistakes and demonstrate that they can grow and change. Um, it is not a sign of weakness to wear a mask. It is a sign of strength. It is not actually a sign of strength to walk around and feel like you can conquer this virus just with your macho behavior. In fact, you put other people at risk when you don't wear a mask. And so I like to tell people like, my mask helps protect you and your mask helps protect me. And if you are in a position of leadership or authority like our president is, you should be the number one leader demonstrating that I'm wearing a mask everywhere I go so that all Americans will see that strong leadership of role modeling that wearing masks is what we need to do as U.S. citizens to protect each other and so we can all get through this pandemic and not die. Uh, I have some friends that are my, around my age and some a little younger than me and they say, oh, they, they can't get the mask uh, because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, they don't want to wear a mask rather because they feel like they can't get it. And I talk about a lot of stories. I had, I had a, a friend and she, they were in the hospital for 30 some odd days. They were 26 years old. So... You know, what is in the, their minds that they believe that they can't get it? Is this just the media getting into their head and, you know, them believing kind of propaganda that says, oh, if you're young, you can't get it, or, oh, I'm young, I won't die, I won't get sick in the hospital for 30 some odd days. What do you think, is you're a person that's a doctor that studies you know, a lot of these issues, what do you think is in their head and why they're thinking this way? Certainly young people have this myth of in, infallibility that I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm not going to get sick. There's this perception that um, because I'm young, I'm, I'm strong. Um, certainly in general, younger people are stronger, but diseases like coronavirus don't sort of uh, segregate by age. It's not like just because you're young, you can't get the virus. And so we already know that young people can be seriously impacted by the disease. So I think the issue here there's two issues. The first one is access to masks, right? And so we have to acknowledge that initially, certainly in the healthcare community, we didn't have sufficient personal protective equipment for the frontline healthcare workers. That issue is getting better, a lot better now. Um, uh, but the second issue is the choice of wearing a mask at all or any kind of face covering. Like, even if I don't have a mask, I wear a shirt. Can I do this? You bet I can. Can I put something over my mouth and nose that keeps me the, my coughing from spreading the aerosolized droplets? You bet I can. So the issue here is not actually access to masks. The issue is a decision to choose not to wear one or to wear a face covering. And that decision is usually coming from people's misinformation about the how masks help and or a belief that they're, like you said earlier, too macho, I don't need to wear it. I'm, I'm, I'm too cool to wear a mask or I, I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna listen to the science. And, and the way to prevent that from continuing is to educate people about how and why when they don't wear masks, it 
increases the death count of the disease and increases risking other people. For some reason I yeah, coughed and I left my thing on mute. Uh, mean is Can I just laugh with you about the cough right there? What you just did was you covered your cough by muting yourself. In a way, it's kind of poetic <laughs> irony of what happened with our interview. That's true. That's true. Amina Zam here on Fire Breathe the How do you feel the government got this virus wrong? Lots of places we stumbled as a country and our government in the way that our government handled this global pandemic and uh, the arrival of the virus in the U.S. shores. Um, uh, so uh, without sort of a going itemized by itemized list of all of those, I think we can look to other countries' reactions and the way other country governments re responded uh, for lessons learned and strategies that can do a better job than what we did, right? I think the key is to trust and believe in science and to act quickly to do the public health measures we know can reduce the spread of the virus. So. You need to be doing contact tracing so that when someone is known to have the virus, we know who they were in contact with. You need to have lots of testing so that we can confirm those who have the virus have it and rather than guessing that they have it or not. And we need to continue listening to our public health officials in the degree of social distancing and mask wearing that we can reduce the spread of the virus. Going forward, we're gonna have a lot of hot spots ahead. We're gonna have a lot more sort of spikes of the virus in different parts of the United States. And we're gonna need to social tamp down on our social distancing will increase in those areas. So we don't have those hot spots spread like wildfire. Yep. I mean, again, I don't want to, I agree with you, let's not politicize this. Um, uh, we, I don't want to talk blue states, red states. Let's talk about what states have done to sort of find the balance sure. between Please. public health and safety and uh, economic health, if you will, right? I know a lot of the media is presenting this as an either or. Well, if we don't open up with the economy, people will suffer fiscally. But if we open the economy too fast, people will suffer physically, right? So there's that sort of balancing thing. Um, at the same time, if we have clear guidance about what would need to happen for us to open more, that would be good. I'll speak only about California, the state I live in. The yeah. governor has offered a sort of a four steps of phased in approach to begin to open up sort of various activities in the terms of the number of people and the close proximity and the type of venue. That's an example where we can wrap our heads around, okay, if the number of disease cases goes down by this much, we will start to open up this much. So a strategy and a plan for opening rather than just throwing our hands up and saying, well, we'll go open up everything and good luck people out there, right? So I right. think we need to look for examples of governmental leadership that are setting in motion data-based, evidence-based plans or strategies for opening up the economy slowly as long as people remain healthy why this requires strong federal level leadership rather than county level leaders. It would be great if it were both and, not just California or the governor, but the state leadership and the county leadership are all in line with our federal leadership who would be demonstrating federal level policy. And unfortunately, I do think there's lots of ways in which our federal government has failed our country. So you spoke about earlier on in the interview that, you know, stress plays a huge role in your immune system. And, you know, if you do have the virus, that's going to really hurt you a lot. So what would you tell somebody as far as like how they can mentally stay sane if they do have the virus and they're worried about obviously getting even more sick and dying because we've heard of, you know, over 109,000 people have died all over the country. So how would you tell them to kind of relax, take it easy and stay sane uh, while they're in the hospital or if they're at home in quarantine? Yeah. Well, while they're in the hospital, hopefully those healthcare providers are there to offer emotional support as well mm -hmm. as the physical support. So I would hope that they're feeling that they're, those needs are being met there. When you're home in quarantine, it's a totally different landscape. I think this is a good place for me, if you're willing for me to share some resources about yes, this. Please. Um, so, um, so I work at UCSF in the Department of Psychiatry. And I'm going to go to that website first. So our department has produced uh, a list of resources here, COVID-19 mental health resources. And I'm just going to show you as you look through it, um, uh, useful wellness and mental health apps, emotional well-being and coping during COVID-19, seeking help, families, information for maintaining wellness for older adults and caregivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these are available. And as you scroll up on that site, you'll see that these are all freely available and they're advice from the mental health professionals at my fine institution um, to help make sure you address your emotional well-being. So uh, as you look through this site, you'll see 
lots of tips, lots of good resources. This is all what I consider to be high quality and reliable health information to maintain your emotional well-being. So even just picking one at random, how to helping children to cope, tips and resources to help children with fear. So here are some resources to help young children manage fear. Uh, a, a book for parents to support children with feelings of fear. Here's a free webinar on for children on when we are scared, which is available in English and Spanish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really proud of all the resources that my department has put together to help people address these issues. That's great. Now, you did say you had uh, some other resources too. Um, yeah. Right. All right, so I'd like you mentioned Osmosis. I work at Osmosis as well. So our osmosis.org is the name of the company. And you can see here our, our, our COVID-19 landing page. So, uh, you know, forward slash COVID-19. So this is all the information that Osmosis has produced about COVID-19. So we have actually a little playful uh, music video with our Osmosis team. Uh, but there's also a, a how can I learn about COVID-19, what you need to know. This is a course on Coursera, so it's totally free, um, but it also is eligible for health professionals to get professional development credit for doing that course. As you scroll up further, you'll see we've got a bunch of res resources on videos like how to wear an N95 mask, um, uh, how to learn and disinfect frequently touched surfaces, um, how to, um, wash your hands properly, um, and other kinds of things like that. We scroll up further and you'll see this is where I mentioned my colleague, Dr. Desai, who is the pediatric infectious disease doc, chief medical officer at Osmosis. And he's been doing a series of uh, more detailed information about like remdesivir as a potential sort of medication treatment for coronavirus and talking about what that means. Scroll up further, you're gonna see um, we have some other resources for maximizing mental and physical health. So here's a video I did on, you know, maximizing your psychological well-being uh, during stressful times. Here's a guided meditation de-stress from one of our other teammates, Gil. Uh, yoga, taking care of your mind and body. So a bunch of videos there. Scroll up further and we start to get to some additional like print-based resources. So here are some fact sheets about coronavirus. So I'm just going to click on one just to give you a sense of we've done it. What's the difference between social distancing and quarantine? Um, you know, what are the symptoms of coronavirus? That's totally free and downloadable. I'm just showing you a preview of it here. In addition, here's some coloring pages for, these are mostly targeted to help professional students because they're drawn anatomically correct, but you know, coloring is a nice way to sort of emotionally uh, have some say a respite, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Here further are some infographics. So when you wash your hands, which parts of your hands do you tend to miss when you're washing? Um, and um, so uh, if you were to click on that, find more resources, you'll see uh, other uh, coronavirus infographics that we produce at Osmosis about how does coronavirus compare to other global pandemics or other infectious diseases like mm -hmm. MERS and SARS uh, and the regular sort of uh, uh, other annual seasonal things like uh, the you know regular flu kind of stuff. So that's available too. Um, and then we've got coronavirus stories from around the world. So you can hear how people are addressing the virus in their local communities. Uh, this one just happens to pick Lebanon, but we are a company that's interested in providing resources for people all over the world. Um, and so some of those are there as well. So we are uh, big believers in high quality health information to the world's population in ways that they need now. And so I hope that's useful to all of your viewers and listeners. I mean, before you go, can you tell people where they can find more information about you if they want to get in contact with you? Sure. Maybe. Sure, thanks uh, for that. So I am on faculty at three uh, San Francisco Bay Area Health Science Universities. Here is my profile that you see a stuff. So you could look me up at the University of California, San Francisco, and you'll find this page and details about me. Um, similarly, I'm at Samuel Merritt University in Oakland, California. So you could look me up. There's my email through Samuel Merritt. Um, you can also look me up at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. There's my contact information there. And then of course, there's always LinkedIn. I mean, they sort of you can find you're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is I am I am passionate about educating health professionals, yeah. the next generation of health professionals, uh, and I happen to be at several universities. But ultimately, it's all about educating people, citizens, 
people in the world to have high quality information so we can make informed choices. So I'm happy to talk to your viewers. Amin Azam, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Rob, for what you're doing.